Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. And, uh, you know how I said all the requests I've taken so far seem to be from the 90s? Uh, yeah, I took a look at all the other requests, and, um, that's not really gonna change. It's almost entirely from that decade. So, just for the sake of variety, I decided to look at the one request I got from before the 90s. And boy, is it a doozy. I've been sitting on this one for a while. I said I got tired of New Wave songs, so I've been avoiding them, but man, it's been too long. Weird New Wave songs are this show's bread and butter. It was made for guys like this. This guy is named Thomas Dolby, and he hit the big time in 1982 with his weirdo novelty smash, She Blinded Me With Science. It's a strange song that's Hard to imagine existing at any other time. I honestly don't even know who this is for. Like, how do you listen to it? What am I supposed to do with this? But it certainly has its fans. I have a friend who says it's his favorite song of all time. Look. Yes, I can confirm that my favorite song is in fact Thomas Dolby's She Blinded Me With Science. Thanks. And, uh, two quick follow-up questions, Brad. One, really? And two, why? Come on, the song's like poetry in motion, man. And it combines several things that I love. Mad scientists, one-hit wonders, and it is the most 1982 of 1982 new wave. I guess that makes sense. Also, I was on a lot of drugs in my 20s. That also makes sense. Drugs are science, too. But yeah, when MTV first hit, it seemed like stuff like this was all they played. Synth pop had already been tagged as music for nerds, and She Blinded Me With Science was the logical outcome. A herky-jerky pop song by a guy who looked like the goddamn Reanimator. Though of course it's not the best song by a guy that looks like the Reanimator. That of course would be Move Your Dead Bones by Dr. Reanimator. Again, that is Move Your Dead Bones by Dr. Reanimator. I will bring this song up at every opportunity. But we probably wouldn't have Dr. Reanimator without Thomas Dolby, and for that we owe him a serious debt of gratitude. So get out your test tubes and pocket protectors, we're going to do a deep dive into science. Which one? Doesn't matter, it's just science! So put on your safety goggles so you don't get blinded by all the science! Okay, so this guy's real name is Thomas Robertson from London, England. His original stage name was just Dolby, but then the Dolby sound people made him stop. But it's a fitting stage name. As you can tell, this is a guy who was really into sound technology. And this is from back in the day, when synthesizers were insanely expensive. I mean, it's like nothing today. I mean, I got this electric piano I got used for $200. I got a, like another synthesizer on top of it. See? It's no thing, but back in the day, you had to be a serious nerd. And of course, this guy was. He was the nerdiest of them all. In fact, let's listen to some of the geek-tastic synth pop this guy made. Oh right, I forgot. Uh, before he started his career, he got his start doing session work for foreign. Yeah, yeah, this guy's a real jukebox hero. But anyway, he used that as a launching pad for his music career. He released his first album, The Golden Age of Wireless, in 1982. Here's his first single, Europa and the Pirate Twins. I was 14, she was 12. It's, um, it's about a girl named Europa, and when she and the narrator were kids together, they used to pretend to be pirate twins, and they promised that they'd meet again someday. But Turns out she became a movie star, so he can't get in contact with her. Also, there was a war, and people now travel by hoverport. There's a lot going on here. Dolby says he writes songs like a frustrated novelist. And you can tell he was extremely influenced by David Bowie's Berlin work. But what I notice here is that he already has his persona completely nailed down. He said he first tried to be like a new romantic, you know, lots of frilly clothes and makeup and... 
Yeah, no. Just look at this guy. So instead, he decided to lean into the whole nerd thing. His dad was a professor, his siblings were professors, so if he has to dress up, why not just go full Revenge of the Nerd style nerd? He took a look at himself and he said, I should at all times look like I'm cosplaying as Egon in the real Ghostbusters. No, that doesn't even exist yet, I am that forward thinking. But the album didn't generate any hits or anything. I kind of imagine the record executives being like, what's with all this crazy shit about satellites? Why don't you write something normal? Why don't you just write a silly love song? And Dolby's like, a silly love song, huh? So here we have it, an MTV novelty song about love and mad science. It's, uh, it's romantic, I guess. Unless it's meant literally, because there are many ways to be blinded to science. My eyes, the goggles do nothing. Now, I want to be clear, Thomas Dolby is extremely legit. He's weird, but he's not a novelty and he's not a joke. But this song is absolutely a novelty and a joke. He calls it the most frivolous song he ever wrote. Which is proof that he's better with words than I am, because I was going to call it goofy as balls. But, uh, yeah, let's go with frivolous. But to me, this is like the inevitable endpoint of all synthesizer songs up to that point. From the very beginning, people associated synthesizers with cold, impersonal technology. All the original generation of synth bands were like robots or mad science geeks. He's just doing the most obvious version of that. But also, this just hit at exactly the right time. Science had a real stranglehold on the popular consciousness. Somewhere around the late 70s, early 80s, people started just getting their minds blown by all the new technology. I mean, there's always new technology, but it hadn't affected anyone's normal life for a while. Your average house was exactly the same for 30 years. You got a TV, a car, fridge, phone, some stereo equipment maybe. And then, all of a sudden, there's this big leap forward in how you live your life. There are computers! They use those to land on the moon and now you've got one in your goddamn house! You can play games on it, you can type things and print it out on the world's loudest printer. You got like VCRs, video games, you can carry around your music with you. You got a thing that emits radiation and you use it to cook food that you eat. Oh my god! The future is now! We're living in it! My watch has a calculator on it! Science! And it even has an actual famous scientist in it. This guy is Magnus Pike. He was like the Bill Nye of England in the 70s. She blinded me with science! It's kind of amazing to me that this guy was real because he seems like a straight-up cartoon, like, like he's a mad scientist in a kid's show. At the very least, this is a pleasant reminder of the time when musical artists worked with TV scientists instead of releasing diss tracks at them about the shape of the Earth. And also, it's a love song, I guess. And the she who blinded him with science is, of course, Japanese, naturally. At this point, Japan had already cemented its reputation as the country of technology. He even joked once that he was way ahead of the time in fetishizing Asian women. And uh, no one had even heard of anime yet, so uh, uh, yeah, probably. So uh, this all adds up to a song. It is what it is. I mean, no disrespect to my colleagues or anything, but uh, I, I don't really see the appeal. It's a very faddish song, like Kung Fu Fighting or Pac-Man Fever. It's a goof. I mean, Dolby has said as much, though of course he's not ashamed of it. He says he's proud of all the hooks he managed to fit in there, and yeah, it does have a lot of hooks. That's absolutely true. It's got Magnus Pike shouting, SCIENCE! It's got like a synth version of Mad Scientist film scores. Science! And it's certainly got a ton of energy. I don't believe it! Yeah, this is a genre of music I like to call dork funk. The kings of this were the talking heads. In fact, this whole song sounds like a talking heads tribute. Dolby's even doing the David Byrne yelps and shouts. So it's like a, a talking head song, but without the artsiness. 
there's absolutely no pretensions here. There's no attempts at poetry, in motion or not. I mean, it's just funny. It's funny and it's weird. He's playing a cartoon character who loves science so much, the only way he can understand love is through science. I guess. It's just not a very funny joke to me. I, I'm not even clear how she blinded him with science. Is she his assistant? His teacher? I don't know, I don't get it. Maybe science can help me remove the stick from my ass. She Blinded Me With Science wasn't originally part of his first album, but you know, the label reissued it and added that song. And they also added his follow-up single, One of Our Submarines. One of Our Submarines is one of his more literary songs. It's about a crashed submarine. I'm not clear if they're all gonna die or what. They might be at the bottom of the ocean, but I think they're just washed up in the middle of nowhere. The boys are in this it, it doesn't sound like they're gonna be rescued. Okay, heavy water is the water they use in nuclear reactors. So they've literally resorted to drinking their fuel. Dolby said it was inspired by his uncle, who did in fact die in a submarine during World War II. It was inspired by him, it's not about him, because this isn't set during World War II, we're talking about a nuclear sub. And also, there's some talk about the collapse of the British Empire. Bye bye empire, empire bye bye. I guess bye bye empire could mean a lot of things, but that's what I think it means. The empire is sinking, just like this sub. So this crew isn't even fighting for like decency or honor, they're dying for a rotting country and it's all it all seems very sad and meaningless. Can we roll this back for a second? She me with science. She me with science. Just, yeah, it's a bit of a leap. I honestly like one of our submarines a lot more. I like how cold and dark and intense it is, but yeah, it's not really a surprise that he couldn't get his new fans to make that transition. However, after he did put together a second album, he did have another minor hit and he leaned entirely into his big hit. That album is called The Flat Earth. Don't worry, I don't think he actually believes the Earth is flat. Didn't used to have to worry about that, but... The big hit from that album was called Hyperactive, and it was. I'll be honest, just for fun, when I was doing the research for this episode, I started by playing all his videos on mute. And this was definitely the best. And yeah, this was a decent hit in the UK where their 80s was even weirder than our 80s. And you can see, this is where the videos were also influencing the music. What sold on MTV were just the weirdest, craziest visuals that you couldn't find in any other show or movie or anything. So, of course, we had a song about being wacky. Yeah, like, his first album was Bowie, his big hit was The Talking Heads, and this follow-up, I think, is like, Oingo Boingo. It's just, you know, odd, for oddness' sake. It's, it's, it's weird, and it's fun, it's energetic. I, I kind of just want to let it play. For the record, he also directed all his videos, so, yeah, you can tell he's having fun here. He's got a hand puppet of himself that's playing the trombone with his nose. What? And this fits a little better with his persona, right? He said that after his big hit, he immediately identified the formula that made him a success. He'd established a voice, an image, people knew who he was. And he also said that he immediately decided he wasn't interested in continuing it. I scare myself, just thinking about you. So the rest of the album is not like that. Hope you like cocktail jazz! And more dark stuff about blacklisted political dissidents. Yeah, and at this point, Thomas Dolby disappears from the Hot 100. Oh god, tons. Did he ever do anything else? Did he perform at the Grammys with Herbie Hancock and Stevie Wonder? Yeah, yeah he did. That happened. And what else? First of all, he did a lot of work for film music. 
you may remember his theme song to this cinematic masterpiece. They call him Howard the Duck. No way to come steal it. Haha, <laughs> the film would have you believe that Howard himself wrote this. Hardly. Howard was an amazing duck, but he was no Thomas Dolby. Also, I'd always heard this was one of the worst movies ever made, and the hype is real. It is unwatchable. Dolby also wrote this. Yo, the name is Patrick. The logic is erratic. Yes, he did a good chunk of the music from Fern Gully. Like Tim Curry's all-time classic villain song, Toxic Love. Toxic Love. Yeah, all Dolby. He did not do Tone Loke's lizard rap, sadly. He even did a little acting himself. You may have heard of a little film... Well, no, you probably haven't ever heard of a little film called Rockula. A truly bug shit movie about a loser nerd vampire who starts a rock band to court his reincarnated lost love. I meant to watch this for the Tony Basil episode because she plays Rockula's mom, and Bo Diddley is Rockula's lead guitarist, and Thomas Dolby is the villain. He owns, like, a cryogenic coffin store, and here he is wearing a pirate outfit and attacking Rockula with a ham bone for reasons I cannot even begin to explain. But more than that, Dolby was still doing sideman work all through his career. Death Leopards, Pyromania, the keyboard work is all him. And you know how I mentioned his Bowie influence? Well, guess what? At Live Aid, 1985, probably biggest concert of all time, that's him doing keyboards for the Thin White Duke himself. Right... Okay, well he's in there somewhere. I am reasonably well informed that he's there. Oh, and look at this! Y'all ready to party? Are you ready? You know, this is George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. Yeah, get funky. Tear the roof off the sucker. Yeah, I see Thomas Dolby out there. Come on up here and get some of this funk, boy. And what's that? It's Thomas Goddamn Dolby jamming with George Clinton. That doesn't make any sense. And this all happened while he continued his own career. He released some more albums in the late 80s and 90s. George Clinton even helped produce one of them, Aliens Ate My Buick. So yeah, this record is funky. Call her hot sauce. She's hot and spicy. But nice and For a very specific definition of funk. And he was even still kind of successful in the UK through the early 90s. Like I said, he just did what he wanted. He had a Zydeco period. But that was before music took a backseat in his life and he went to start his own company where he worked on digital sound. He designed his own music file format. And he also developed some kind of massive leap forward in ringtone technology. That was him! Or his company at least. He's the artist of our generation. And that's on top of the billion other things he's been doing. See, here he is giving a TED Talk. I have to imagine the TED Talk people didn't have a hard time booking him because he was their musical director for a good 11 years. He also released an album in 2011 that came with its own video game. It's not online anymore, but from what I can tell, the winning team got the greatest prize of all. An exclusive concert from Thomas Dolby. I mean, yeah, you can compete for money in eSports, but... The real prize has already been taken. Um... Almost? I don't know. He's obviously a for real talented guy, but it, it never quite came together for me. Not the same way that his influences like Bowie or the Talking Heads do. It wasn't for me. But that's kind of the appeal of him, that he's not for everyone. He was just a very singular guy with a very weird muse that he wasn't afraid to follow no matter where it took him. And I just admire the guy for being who he is. He made a song about mad science, and he was a legit kind of mad scientist. That's awesome. Thank you, Mr. Dolby, for blinding me with your novelty music and hilarious music videos. It's poetry in motion She turn a tender right on me Deep as any ocean